Hello, everyone. I am thrilled to be in conversation with you today at the AAAS. Um, my comments today are framed around this question, race to the future, reimagining the default settings of technology and society. I really love the theme, understanding dynamic ecosystems. And as a sociologist, one thing I hope to contribute to the conversation are a set of conceptual tools or interpretive lenses that we can use to better understand our ecosystem. One way to describe this year uh, of all years is that the lights have been turned all the way on and many people are observing our social reality anew. They are seeing things that they haven't had to see before. And I think too often we then rely on our personal experiences, our professional frameworks in order to understand a really complex ecosystem. And so in that mix, I want to offer some social scientific insights that I hope can make this our, our vision of this, um, this world a bit clearer so that we can diagnose our reality with greater precision so that ultimately we can transform it. In the process, I want to suggest that racism has a way of distorting our ability to perceive reality accurately. It distorts not only how we see the world, our external reality, but even distorts our internal reality, how we know ourselves and our own place in the world. At all levels, institutional, interpersonal, and internal, we have to wrestle with and reckon with the way that racism continues to distort how we see each other, how we understand ourselves. So I'm gonna plot some data points to give some concrete um, resolution to this uh, claim that racism distorts our reality. We'll begin first in the context of policing, which of course have gotten a lot of attention in terms of our news media this year, in terms of protests, in terms of institutional statements that have come out in support of Black Lives. And so what I, one thing we need to do is really to look beyond the spectacular instances of violence to read reality beneath the surface, what's happening behind closed doors. One example of many I could choose is this image that was leaked a few years ago by Miami PD. These are the faces that the police department was using for target practice. So before they patrol the streets, these are the individuals that look like my brothers, my sons, my father. And so it's no wonder that these also become the bodies upon which we see the most pronounced forms of police violence. And so it's this undercurrent, what's happening under the surface that we have to reckon with to truly understand this ecosystem of anti-Blackness. At the same time, and here I point out, one of the responses when this photo was leaked, that clergy, majority white clergy, in fact, in Miami, created a hashtag use me instead. And they put their own faces there for all to see in order to call out the hypocrisy of this institution that is sworn to protect and serve actually targeting uh, at, uh, one portion of our, of our population. And so we build on that tradition, use me instead. And so as we shine a light on the forms of anti-Blackness that infect and distort how we see each other and how we know ourselves, we can also build on this longer tradition of anti-racism in our own work, in our own families, in our own communities. And so we move from policing, which again, again tends to get most of the attention, to education, to preschool. In this case, some colleagues of mine at the Yale School of Education put eye tracking technology on preschool teachers and then had them look at little children playing together and told them to look for the challenging behavior. And the teacher's attention continuously went to the little black boys in the playgroup, even though they were behaving the same way as all the other children. And so here we see that in one instance, profiling in adulthood to policing in preschool, there's a spectrum of anti-Blackness that infects all of our institutions. And so we move now to public perceptions of policies that then become the, the institutional basis that underwrites so much of this individual level prejudice and profiling. 
Here's a study from Stanford in which the researchers presented white Americans with data from our carceral system, our criminal justice system, showing the much higher rate of black incarceration. And then they asked after showing this data, would you be willing to support policies that would help to reform this status quo? In, in California, the policy was a three strikes law. In New York, the policy was a stop and frisk. And what the researchers found was that using statistics to inform the public about racial disparities can actually backfire. Worse yet, it can cause some people to be more supportive of the policies that create those inequalities. So the question for us becomes those of us who are committed to empiricism and, and committed to knowledge production, what's happening between the data and people's perceptions, their cognitive abilities, we might call them interpretive lenses that distort how they understand those statistics that show that higher rate of black incarceration. We might call it narratives, social narratives. We might call it lies that help to justify why we see this higher rate of incarceration. For example, you might see more black people locked up in our jails and prisons and assume, well, they must be more crimogenic. Why would I support policies to be any more lenient, to be any more um, uh, you know, uh, lenient on these populations. And so again, we have to think about being as rigorous about the statistics that we produce. We have to be as rigorous about the stories that people tell and that we tell about the data, because ultimately that's really what shapes the conclusions that are drawn about these, the, these kind of uh, disparity data, whether in the context of incarceration or in the context of healthcare, as we saw with the pandemic this year. And so for us, it becomes really important, again, to map this ecosystem to understand where did these distortions come from? To do so, we would have to take a little detour, and here, bear with me for a minute, uh, into the history of science, to reckon with how our own professions in the social sciences and, and life sciences have helped to erect this racist architecture in which we all still live today. So one individual, many I could point to, is shown here, George Cuvier. Cuvier was a French naturalist, a renowned scientist of his day, who was also one of the chief architects of racist ideas um, in terms of the hierarchies of populations. And so Cuvier wrote, the white race with oval face, straight hair and nose, to which the civilized people of Europe belong, and which appear to us the most beautiful of all, is also superior to others by its genius, courage, and activity. He went on to write, the Negro race, marked by black complexion, crisp of woolly hair, compressed cranium, and flat nose, the projection of the lower parts of the face and thick lips, evidently proximate to the monkey tribe, the hordes of which have consistently remained in the most complete state of barbarism. So there's a lot going on here, even with these two passages of Cuvier that we could probably spend an hour unpacking. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to highlight a couple things. The first is to note this binary, this distinction between blackness and whiteness. So if we think about um, racism as a building, the architecture of racism, which is being built through science and through um, these, these, real, these ways of legitimizing this building, then Blackness and whiteness become the twin pillars. And so these distinctions become important to holding up this broader architecture, even though humanity is vastly diverse. That's why we have to understand these twin pillars and the distinctions of inferiority and superiority that are being mapped out in the way that Cuvier is. The second thing to note for us is the role of the body. You see here, he's not just talking in the abstract. White civilization is superior, black cultures are inferior. He's mapping these suppositions onto something flesh and blood, something concrete. Every part of the body is being dissected for evidence of this hierarchy, the nose, the lips, the hair. And so the question for us becomes why? Why, why go into such detail? Why attempt to ground it in the body? And that's because the more that we can make these political categories of race as seem as if they are natural, immutable, inherent, God-given, the less likely people are to question them. And the less likely we are to question them, 
the less likely we are to try to change them. And so naturalizing racial categories was a key methodology of trying to hold this architecture together. And so one of the first things we can all begin to do, and this is especially true for those in the life sciences and those who work in medicine, is to denaturalize these racial distinctions rather than try to uphold them. This, the last thing I'll say before moving on is that oftentimes when we bring up these historical examples, people's gut reaction is to say, well, we can't judge the past by our standards today. That's not fair. But it's important to note that at every instance of race making, every brick that is laid in this racial architecture, there have been individuals, groups, and movements that have worked to topple it that have worked to counteract it. In this case, with Cuvier, his own student was one of the individuals who refuted his notions of anti-Blackness and his racist hierarchy. His name was Frederick Tiedman, and he published refutations against his teacher. Again, talking about the role of students in questioning the paradigms that are passed down from generation to generation. And so in the same way that we build on the tradition of use me instead, we're building on Tiedman's stubbornness when it came to accepting this racist paradigm, which brings us back to the present to think about how those ideas continue to infect and distort our vision today. Of course, popular culture plays a huge role. Our media landscape is part of the ecosystem that continues to reify and naturalize racist distinctions. One example of many I could point to is this Vogue cover that shows LeBron and Giselle, who are positioned in the very same way that this World War I propaganda poster. In that case, the mad brute was the German, but here we see in the choice of LeBron's expression, his posture, his hand position all the way down to his uh, sneaker choice is meant to evoke that brutishness, mapping it onto the black body. And he's not on that cover alone. Remember those twin pillars. You have Giselle here with a very different demeanor meant to contrast LeBron as, as, as much as possible. And so we see how even through the seemingly innocent cover of two celebrities, the ideas of Cuvier and his colleagues continue to infect our vision today, which brings us to technology. Technology is one other arena in which we have to be watchful and reckon with the role of anti-Blackness. In this case, a simple exercise will get us thinking critically. If you go to your Google Images and you type in the phrase unprofessional hairstyles, you'll see the images on your left. Type in professional hairstyles. You'll see the images on your right, and you begin to see a pattern emerge in which Black women's natural hair is coded literally unprofessional, a la uncivilized, taking us back to Cuvier. With some exceptions, of course, you see the Hunger Games lady to your left, you see Beyonce on your right, but exceptions notwithstanding, the larger rule holds in which Black women's hair is presented as inferior through the, this search. So much so that in some states they've begun to pass laws around hair-based discrimination because it's so common in schools and in workplaces. So in this case, our technology is reflecting back at us long-standing patterns of discrimination and bias. And so the question is, how do we make sense of that? How do we reimagine the default settings of technology and society? Well, as a first step, I want to uh, suggest that we have to move beyond a techno-deterministic understanding of this relationship. By that, I mean the assumption that technology is in the driver's seat and that we are either harmed or helped, but that the human agents and agencies are missing from the script. There are two main dynamics, two main stories that we tell about technology. The first one on your left is the techno dystopian story. The robots are going to slay us. They're going to devour humanity, take all the jobs. Everything bad will come from innovation. And this is, of course, is the story that Hollywood loves to sell us. On your right is the techno-utopian story, which is the idea that technology is going to save us. It's going to make everything better, more efficient, more fair. And this is the story that Silicon Valley loves to sell us. And while they seem like opposing narratives, they have different endings. In fact, they share an underlying logic that technology is the driver and that 
What's missing is a critical understanding of what's happening behind the screen. What are the human decisions, values, insights, uh, ideologies that are becoming materialized in our hardware and our software? And so as a first step in reimagining the relationship of technology and society, we have to actually understand the relationship rather than assume that particular types of technological innovation are inevitable. Because the more we think of them as inevitable, the less likely we are to question, to push back, and to demand better. And so to think again about the power dynamics in this ecosystem in which we're looking at the role of humans behind the screen, it becomes really important to think about how free existing power dynamics get baked in to our seemingly new technologies. And to, un to unpack that idea, I just want to share a, real, a recent experience as I was going to speak with students at Harvey Mudd College in Southern California, which is a, a STEM-oriented school. So I was racing through Newark International Airport. I overheard two men sitting in one of the restaurants, one saying to the other, I just want someone I can push around, dot, dot, dot. I kind of made a mental note of this uh, expression, and I thought, wow, that sentence could end in so many different ways. Perhaps he was looking through resumes, deciding who to hire, and wanting someone to push around at work. Or he could have been looking through his dating app, trying to think about who to push around in his personal life. In any case, it occurred to me that this uh, moment that we're living in has given newfound license to express this form of power, where one person's power relies on someone else to be subordinate. But I had to remind myself that this is only one form of power, that we can imagine and engender forms of power that don't rely on oppression, that actually we can empower one another, a kind of horizontal vision of power in this ecosystem. And so as I was ruminating on that, I thought, well, you know, again, thinking ahead to my talk at Harvey Mudd, this has a lot to do with technology and the way that we embed certain modes of power in technology. And this ad from 1957 um, came up from a Mechanics Illustrated magazine that I ended up incorporating in my talk with the students, where it says, the robots are coming. When they do, you'll command a host of push-button servants. In 1863, Abe Lincoln freed the slaves, but by 1965, slavery will be back. We'll all have personal slaves again, it says. Don't be alarmed. We mean robot slaves. Again, so much going on here. We could unpack for days, but I'll just point out a couple things before moving on. Again, thinking critically about power and technology. The first thing to note is the date, 1957. What is happening in the ecosystem, in the larger milieu, that would give rise to the demand and the desire for robot servants. Who was usually dressing you, combing your hair, and serving you meals in a jiffy, as the ad says? That is, who was doing the free and cheap domestic labor? And so we think about what's changing in the social milieu. There is more, go there's growing feminist movement, there's growing civil rights movement, so that the free labor of housewives and the cheap labor of Black people are pushing back, are changing the terrain in which um, that, that labor was exploited. And so you can see how robot servants would be a welcome, a welcome intervention for some, which leads us to the second point. One little word in this ad, if you take a close look, we'll all have personal slaves again. That one little word tells us who the imagined users or beneficiaries of this technology are. Certainly not those who are the descendants of people who were enslaved the first time. So we see that the users or the consumers of this technology are raced, classed, gendered, without race, class, or gender ever being mentioned. That is, those interlocking systems of oppression are encoded in that one little word, again, we'll all have personal slaves again. So the point is, when we zoom out from the, the technology, the, the automated servant, to look at the broader ecosystem, we see that both the inputs and the outputs, the desires and the demands that are being baked into it, and the way that it's going to circulate, who's going to consume it, 
all of this has to be part of our analysis as we reimagine the relationship between technology and society. It was true in 1957 and true today which again brings us to some of the more emerging technologies, the forms of automation that we're presented with today as a straightforward good. To understand those and to bring the two parts of my, my presentation together, I want to offer three takeaways, three provocations for you to, to chew on. The first is this. Racism is productive. Of course, when I say that, I don't mean racism is good. I'm saying in the literal capacity of racism to produce things of value to some, even as it wreaks havoc on others. Because many of us are still taught to think of racism as an aberration, a glitch, an accident, an isolated incident, a bad apple in the backwoods and outdated, rather than as innovative systemic, diffuse, an attached incident, the entire orchard in the ivory tower, in the tech industry, forward-looking, productive. In my field of sociology, we often say race is socially constructed, but we often fail to state the corollary that racism constructs. The second takeaway is that race and technology shape one another. Because again, more and more people are accustomed to thinking about the social and ethical impacts of technology. For any of you who saw the Netflix film Social Dil Dilemma, that's the way that that film portrays technology as having impacts. But that's only half of the story. Because social values, norms, structures all exist prior to any given tech development. So it's not simply the impacts we need to be concerned about, but the inputs that makes some inventions appear inevitable and desirable, which leads to a third provocation, that imagination is a contested field of action, not an ephemeral afterthought that we have the luxury to dismiss or romanticize, but a resource, a battleground, an input and output of technology and social order. In fact, we should acknowledge that most people are forced to live inside someone else's imagination. And one of the things we have to come to grips with is how the nightmares that many people are forced to endure are the underside of elite fantasies about efficiency, profit, safety, and social control. Racism, among other axes of, of domination, helps to produce a fragmented imagination where you have misery for some, monopoly for others. This means that for those of us who want to construct a different social reality, transform our current ecosystem, we can't only critique the underside, that is who these harmful systems, who, who these harmful systems target, but rather we also have to wrestle with the deep investments, the desire even that many people have for social domination. I just want someone I can push around. So those are the main takeaways. Now, let me present a few more concrete examples before moving towards a close. Starting with this relatively new app called Citizen, which will send you real-time crime alerts based on your curated selection of 911 calls. It also offers a way for users to report, live stream, and comment on reported crimes via the app. And it will also show you incidents as red dots on a map so you can avoid particular areas, which is a slightly less racialized version of other apps called Ghetto Tracker and Sketch Factor, which use public data to help people avoid supposedly dangerous areas. So some of you are probably thinking, what could possibly go wrong in the age of barbecue Beckys? calling the police on Black people, cooking, walking, breathing, bird watching, out of place. It turns out that even a Stanford-educated environmental scientist living in the Bay Area can be an ambassador of the carceral state, calling the police on a cookout at Lake Merritt. It's worth noting, too, that this app, Citizen, was originally called the less chill name, Vigilante. And in its uh, in, in rebranding, it also moved away from encouraging people to stop crime, but rather now simply to uh, report it. As one member of the New York City Council put it, crime is now at historic lows in the city, 
But because residents are constantly being bombarded with push notifications of crime, they believe the city is going to hell in a handbasket. Not only is this categorically false, but it's distracting people from very real public safety issues like reckless driving or rising opioid use that don't show up on the app, he said. What's most important to our discussion is that tech fixes, uh, citizen and other tech fixes, um, are not simply about technology's impact, but also about how social norms and values, racial norms and values, shape what tools are imagined necessary in the first place. This dynamic is what I take up in two new books. The first examines the interplay of race automation and machine bias more broadly as an extension of older forms of racial domination. The second is an edited volume on the carceral dimensions of technology across a wide range of social arenas, from more traditional sites like policing and prisons to less obvious contexts like the retail industry, financial technologies, healthcare technologies, and the digital service economy. In terms of popular discourse, what got me started down this road was the proliferation of headlines and hot takes like these about so-called racist and sexist robots. A few years ago, there was a first wave of stories that seemed to be shocked at the prospect that technology is not neutral. A second wave seemed less surprised. Well, of course, technology inherits its creator's biases. And now I think we've entered a phase of attempts to override and address the default settings of racist and sexist robots, for better or worse. And one of the challenges we face is how to meaningfully differentiate technologies that are being used to differentiate us. Take, for example, a recent study. Racial bias in the medical algorithm favors white patients over sicker black patients, reports a new study by Obermeyer and colleagues in which the researchers were actually able to look inside the black box of algorithm design, which is typically not possible with proprietary systems. What's especially important to note here is that this algorithm does not explicitly take note of race. That is to say, it is race neutral. By using cost to predict healthcare needs, this digital triaging system unwittingly reproduces racial disparities in healthcare because on average, black people incur fewer costs for a variety of reasons, including systemic racism. In my review of the study by Obermeyer and colleagues, I argue that indifference to social reality on the part of tech designers and adopters can be even more harmful than malicious intent. In the case of this widely used healthcare algorithm affecting millions of people, more than double the number of black patients would have been enrolled in programs designed to help them stay out of the hospital if the predictions were actually based on needs rather than costs. Race neutrality, it turns out, can be a deadly force. This combination of coded bias and imagined objectivity is what I've termed the new gym code, innovation that enables social containment while appearing fairer than discriminatory practices of a previous era, which of course in the United States is called Jim Crow. So let's say in my grandma's generation, she may have walked up to the hospital and seen a huge whites only sign or been pointed to the Negro wing. Now I can go to the front door and yet there may be an automated system that's making decisions about resource allocation that has a similar pattern of discrimination. What I'm drawing attention to with this concept is that technology can hide the ongoing nature of social domination and allow it to penetrate every facet of our lives under the guise of progress. This formulation, as I highlight here, is directly related to a number of other cousin, cousin concepts by wonderful colleagues and scholars, Bulumini, Brown, Noble, Broussard, Eubanks, and others. And what I'm drawing attention to here is that anti-Blackness can get encoded in and exercised through automated systems. And I offer four conceptual offspring to the new Jim Code that break, that break it down further, falling along a spectrum from the most obvious types, engineered inequity, to the most insidious, techno-benevolence. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to sketch the last two with one, an ex example in order to give you a sense of where this is going. Coded exposure names the tension between ongoing surveillance of racialized populations and calls 
for digital recognition and inclusion, the desire to literally be seen by technology, that little green light on the top of our screens. What I'd like to underscore, though, is that it's not only in the process of being out of sight, but also in the danger of being too centered, that racialized groups are made vulnerable, so that being included is not simply positive recognition, but can be a form of unwanted exposure, but not without creative resistance, as I'll come back to in just a moment. But first, here's a short uh, a clip from the show Better Off Ted. The episode is called Racial Sensitivity, and it illustrates one side of this dynamic, and then we'll return. Hello, motion sensors. Motioning. Motioning. Please sense me. Oh, uh, one other thing. Lem mentioned that there's uh, something weird going on with the motion sensors in the lab. Oh, yeah. We replaced all the sensors in the building with a new state-of-the-art system that's going to save money. It works by detecting light reflected off the skin. Well, Lem says it doesn't work at all. Lem's wrong. It does work, although there is a problem. It doesn't seem to see black people. The system doesn't see black people? I know. Weird, huh? That's more than weird, Veronica. That's basically, well, racist. The company's position is that it's actually the opposite of racist because it's not targeting black people, it's just ignoring them. They insist the worst people can call it is indifferent. Well. We never should have let that white guy off. We're eight black men in an elevator. Of course the white guy's gonna get off. Veronica? Oh God, this looks way too aggressive. No, it's okay. I think I know why you're all here. Well, most of you. <clears throat> um, I have something prepared. Um, Veronica, you are a terrific boss. Thank you, Lem. I'll take it from here. Let me start by apologizing on behalf of Viridian for this inexcusable situation. I laid into Veronica pretty good. I figured it was my only shot, so I took the gloves off. Oh, that sounds great, Lem. Sounds like you gave the company a really strong message. Oh, yeah. She said they're working 24-7 to make things right. Can you believe this? I know. Isn't it great? We all get our own free white guys. You like it? Yeah. Hey, Ty's the best. He anticipates everything I need. Plus, he picked up my dry cleaner. Oh, and he got this kink out of my neck. Really? Mm-hmm. My white guy sucks. Well, maybe you're just not using yours right. Yeah, maybe it's on you, dude. Shut up, Stu. I got the worst black guy. <laughs> It turned out Lem had also been thinking about the money issue. And he put together some interesting numbers to show us. And then we all went to speak to management in a language they could understand. Within a margin of error of plus or minus 1%. And so, if the company keeps hiring white people to follow black people, to follow white people, to follow black people by Thursday, June 27, 2013, every person on earth will be working for us. And we don't have the parking for that. No way. The show brilliantly depicts how a superficial corporate diversity ethos, the prioritization of efficiency over equity, and the default whiteness of tech development work together to ensure that innovation literally produces containment. The fact that darker skin employees are unable to use the elevators, doors, water fountains, or turn the lights on is treated as a minor inconvenience in service to a greater good. But good for whom is what we have to continuously ask. And all the, although the clip may make us chuckle, the implications for technologies in not being able to accurately read or see 
um, Black people have become more and more pronounced. The stakes have grown. For example, when we think about coded exposure in the context of the pandemic and the widespread uptake of a small device called a pulse oximeter, which more people have started to use at home to measure their blood oxygen levels, we begin to see the life and death stakes. As my colleague Amy Moran Thomas writes in the Boston Review, like the problems magnified by the coded gaze of algorithms elsewhere, even small racial disparities could amplify unequal outputs. She continues, beyond the pulse ox alone, this also matters for other wearable chromatic devices and the algorithms they feed. Pretending that they're colorblind can further amplify how racism, not genetics, explains why Black Americans are dying of COVID. And so we come to the last dimension of the new Jim Code, techno-benevolence, which, again, some of the most interesting developments are those that in which people are trying to address bias of various sorts. Take, for example, new AI techniques to vet job applicants, a company called HireVue aims to, quote, reduce unconscious bias and promote diversity in the workplace by using a, a program that analyzes recorded interviews of prospective employees. It uses thousands of data points, including verbal and nonverbal cues, like facial expression, posture, vocal tone. And then it compares job seeker scores with those of existing top performing employees to decide who to flag as a desirable hire and who to reject. Another value added according to higher view is that there's a lot that a human interviewer misses that AI can keep track of to make quote, data-driven talent decisions. After all, the problem of employment discrimination is widespread and well-documented. So the logic goes, wouldn't this be even more reason to outsource decisions to AI? Well, consider that question in light of a study by a Princeton team of computer scientists who examined whether a popular algorithm trained on human writing online exhibited the same racially biased tendencies that psychologists have documented among humans. In particular, they found that the algorithm associated white sounding names with pleasant words and black sounding names with unpleasant ones, which builds on a classic audit study from about 2002 or three in which two economists sent out thousands of resumes to um, employers in Boston and Chicago, old school resumes. And all they did was change the names on the resumes. All the qualifications were the same. Some had names like Lakeisha and Jamal. Some had names like Emily and Greg. And what they found was that the white sounding names received 50% more callbacks than the black sounding names. So you see here, if we just default to technology to solve our problems of bias and discrimination, we're going to reproduce them and hide them. So too with gender coded words and names as Amazon learned last year when its own hiring algorithm was found discriminating against women. Nevertheless, it should be clear by now why technical fixes that claim to bypass human biases are so desirable. If only we could slay centuries of racist and sexist demons with a social justice bot, beyond desirable, more like magical, magical for employers perhaps, looking to streamline the grueling work of recruitment. A, a curse for many job seekers. As this headline puts it, your next interview could be with a racist bot, bringing us back to that problem space we started with a few minutes ago. Though it's worth noting that some job seekers are already developing ways to subvert the system by trading answers to employers' tests and creating fake applications as informal audits of their own. In fact, there was one HR employee for a major company that recommended people slip the words Oxford or Cambridge into our CVs in invisible white ink to pass the automated screening. In terms of a more collective response, a federation of European trade unions called UNI Global has developed a charter of digital rights for workers, touching on automated and AI-based decisions to be included in bargaining agreements. In the US, the Algorithmic Accountability Bill is one effort to create some protections around the ubiquity of automated decisions in our everyday lives. It's a start, but in no way sufficient to really transform the ecosystem. Another development that keeps me hopeful is that tech workers themselves have increasingly been speaking out against the most egregious forms of corporate collusion with state-sanctioned racism. 
For example, Microsoft employees opposed to the company's ICE contract stated that as the people who build the technologies that Microsoft profits from, we refuse to be complicit. And in just the last month, the Alphabet Workers Union, which is the parent company of Google, has been gaining momentum, which is a wonderful development. And as this article published by Science for the People reminds us, contrary to popular narratives, organizing among technical workers has a vibrant history, including technicians and engineers in the 60s and 70s who fought professionalism, individualism, and reformism to contribute to radical labor organizing. The current tech workers movement, which includes students across our many institutions, can draw from past organizers' strategies and challenges in learning to navigate the contradictions and complexities of organizing in tech today. In terms of education, which I think of as the ground zero for planting a more historically and socially conscious approach to STEM, STEM. I'll also just mention one concrete resource that you all can download for free called the Advancing Racial Literacy in Tech Handbook. And the subtitle is Why Ethics, Diversity in Hiring, and Implicit Bias Trainings Aren't Enough. This was developed by some wonderful colleagues at the Data and Society Research Institute in New York. The aim of this intervention is threefold to develop an intellectual understanding of how structural racism operates in algorithms, social media platforms, and technologies not yet developed, and emotional intelligence concerning how to resolve racially stressful situations within organizations, and a commitment to take action to, to reduce harms to communities of color. In that spirit, initiatives like Data for Black Lives and the Detroit Community Technology Project are just two of the many different tech justice organizations that exist all over the world. Data for Black Lives brings together people working across a number of agencies and organizations in a proactive approach to tech justice, especially at the policy level. And the Detroit Tech Project develops and uses technology rooted in community needs offering support to grassroots networks doing data justice research, including hosting what they call discotheques, which stands for discovering technology, which are these multimedia um, mobile neighborhood workshop fairs that can be adapted in other locales. Taken together, this is part of a growing movement of organizations that are transforming paranoia about surveillance technologies into power galvanizing communities to take a proactive approach to designing the world they want and need. Together, they're also building on a long tradition of data justice scholars and journalists, from W.E.B. Du Bois and his data visualizations, to Ida B. Wells Barnett's expert deployment of statistics and stories in the red record. These are the shoulders that we stand on today. Among these giants is the late legal and critical race scholar, Derek A. Bell, who encouraged a radical assessment of reality through creative methods and racial reversals. He wrote, to see things as they really are, you must imagine them for what they might be, which is why I'm convinced that the arts and the humanities are so vital to any discussion or any movement around data justice. One of my favorite examples of a racial reversal is this parody project that begins by subverting the anti-Black logics embedded in new high-tech approaches to crime prevention. Instead of using predictive policing techniques to forecast street crime, the white-collar early warning system flips the script by creating a heat map that flags city blocks where financial crimes are likely to occur. The system not only brings the hidden but no less deadly crimes of capitalism into view, but it includes an app that alerts users when they've entered, quote, high-risk areas to encourage citizen policing and awareness. Taking it one step further, the development team is working on a facial recognition program to flag individuals who are likely perpetrators. And the training set used to design this algorithm includes the profile photos of 7,000 corporate executives downloaded from LinkedIn. Not surprisingly, the average face of a so-called criminal is white and male. To be sure, creative exercises like this are only comical when we ignore that all of its features are drawn directly from actually existing 
proposals and practices in the real world, including the use of facial images to predict criminality. By deliberately and inventively upsetting the status quo in this way, analysts can better understand and expose the many forms of discrimination that are embedded in and enabled by technologies. So here's my final proposition. If it is the case that inequity and injustice is woven into the very fabric of our society, we saw it from policing to preschool, we see it in our educational system, our healthcare system, even our computer systems, then that means each twist, coil, and code is a chance for us to weave new patterns, practices, and politics. The vastness of the problem that we're up against will be its undoing once we accept that we are pattern makers. If, as I suggested at the start, an ahistoric and asocial approach to science and technology captures and contains, then a historically and socially grounded approach can open up possibilities and pathways. It can create new settings and encode new values and build on critical intellectual traditions that have continuously developed insights and strategies grounded in justice. And my hope is that we all find ways to build on this tradition. Thank you for your attention.